he talks about her, but he, t he, you know, he used to say, I remember this about my man, but he doesn't. He remembers the stories that we tell him, and he thinks that's his memories. But now that he's getting older, he, he, he'll say, I don't remember my mum at all. You know, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember her voice. I don't remember what she sounds like. People in Ireland will always remember the woman that was murdered in the Plaza Hotel, Tala, in Dublin. But do they remember her name? No. This I want to change. Sonia was a beautiful 31-year-old woman who was a single mother to a three-year-old boy. She grew up in Tala with her sisters and parents and they were a close-knit family, even though her parents would separate. Her mother would say she remembers when Sonia was two and all she wanted was for her to have long hair and she would tie her hair up in two little pigtails, just wanting it to grow. All Sonia wanted out of life was what everyone wanted. A happy life, family and children. She was very close to her sisters, especially her sister Claire, who she stayed close with all through her teenage years, but became especially close when they both had children. Tracy, her other sister, would say she was a brilliant mom and would do everything for her son. Her whole life revolved around him. Sonia would not stay with the father of her child. I have read that she was involved in an abusive relationship but I'm unsure if it was with the child's father, so I won't speculate. He would be a well-known tattoo artist around Dublin and he owned his own tattoo shop. On Christmas morning, everyone would be at Claire's house. It was the hub for the family get-togethers. In the afternoon, they'd visit their father and on Stephen's day, they would go to their mother's house. The Christmas of 2013 was no different. Little did they know, though, that this would be the last time all the family would celebrate it together. Sonia worked for 10 years in the glue company in Tala and she was very happy there. By October 2013, she was a few months out of her relationship with the father of her son and here she would meet a fellow worker by the name of Eric Locke. He was 33 and came from Clondalkin. He was tall and handsome. They took a shine to each other not long after Eric started working there and Eric asked her out. He went to her house one or two times and Sonia said that he was very nice. By January 2014, they were still getting along and Eric bought them tickets to go to a comedy club night in the city. While this night was going well for them, it would take a turn when Sonia would go outside to have a cigarette. Eric would soon follow and he would see something that would not sit well with him. Sonia was standing talking to a group of people, which included some men. Eric approached her and asked her what she thought she was doing and that she was a slut and a whore. He grabbed her arm and our Sonia was not going to take this. She said to him, take your hands off me, you psychopath. Straight away, Sonia took no shit and she broke it off with Locke the next day. She stated, I will never let that happen. I must protect my child and I must protect myself. Even though Sonia broke it off with Locke, it wasn't that easy for her as they still worked together and they had to see each other every day, which was difficult. Locke pleaded for another chance. He would bombard her with texts, phone calls and Facebook messages. Sonia was polite but stood her ground that she did not want to date Locke. Then, of course, when this wasn't working, the manipulation tactics kicked in. One day he left work early and rang her and told her he had booked himself into a hotel and was going to kill himself if she didn't go to the hotel. So Sonia did the smart thing and called the Gardaí. When the Gardaí arrived, they found Locke at the mill shopping centre having a cup of coffee. He told the Gardaí it was just a joke, but they did bring him in for an evaluation and he was released later that day. This is where Locke was trying to reinstate himself back into Sonia's life or trying to punish her for leaving him in the first place. But because this did not work, things would escalate. Locke would go on to create a fake Facebook profile under the name of Shane Colley and he would start communicating with Sonia through Messenger. While it was just banter at first, it became quite intimate and risque quite quickly. This led to them deciding to meet up in a hotel for a night. Yes, I know, Sonia was very cautious in not putting up with abuse, but she was also very lonely. Her sister would say she wanted a relationship and family. 
I personally don't think it's the way to go about it and we all make mistakes and bad judgments. Some though cost us dearly, but I won't put up with any comments that victim blame here. We all do stupid things and poor Sonia paid with her life. As the prosecution would later point out, it is important not to judge. You may feel it was unwise. However, Sonia was not on trial. When Sonia told her friends of her plans, they spoke to her and asked, Are you sure it's not Locke? She said the thought had crossed her mind, so she asked the person Shane Colley for a selfie, and he obliged her with one. Ladies, if you are asking for proof of a person, get them to include a selfie with a card with your name on it, in real time, not more than a minute it should take. Photoshop is a thing, I suppose. Oh, I don't know, even that can be foreseen. Just don't do what poor Sonia did. In today's hookup culture, I don't think a person can be safe enough. It's nearly like Russian roulette. Anything can happen. I would not like to be young in this day and age, with so much pressure and so hard to find someone to be with. But that's another conversation. So on the 15th of February 2014, Sonia had decided to meet Shane Colley at the Plaza Hotel in Tala in Dublin. This day was also a very special day for Sonia, as it was her son's third birthday. Sonia spent the day celebrating with her family and she had told them that she was going out that night with a female friend and so her son's grandmother took her son for the night. But what she had arranged was the secret date with a stranger. A neighbour would say later he was probably the last to see her alive. At around 8pm Sonia rushed from her home, meeting and greeting him with a big hello, how are you? And then she was gone. Sonia would check into the Plaza Hotel, just a short distance from her own home. There she would wait for Shane Colley, keeping in contact with him through the night. Shane Colley would insist on Sonia, leaving a card key at reception. But Sonia would say there was no need as she was there and all he had to do was knock and she'd leave him in. But Shane Colley insisted. You see, our Shane knew that if he had no key card to get in, and he let Sonia answer the door to him. She would have looked through the peephole first, see who it really was, and of course she'd know it was really Eric Locke. So poor Sonia gave in and left the keycard at reception. By midnight, Sonia was texting Shane Cully to ask if he would be much longer, as she was falling asleep, that she was really nervous as she had never done anything like this before. He arrived a few minutes later, let himself into the room, and immediately Sonia would realise her worst nightmare was standing in front of her, Eric Locke. What would unfold in the next few hours is every woman's worst nightmare. Eric brought with him a kill kit, which he would use on Sonia in the most horrific way. Duct tape, BB gun, Stanley knife, or a box cutter to some of you, and zip ties. It would later come out what happened to poor Sonia exactly. The next day, as Sonia had not checked out of her room, housekeeping made entry at 3pm. There they would find Sonia's lifeless body on the floor, fully dressed. The guardi were called straight away, along with the state pathologist. On entering the room, it was apparent that there was foul play involved. And on examination of Sonia's body, they found ligature marks around her neck, with her t-shirt pushed deep into her throat. Meanwhile, Sonia's son's grandmother rang her family to say she had not collected her son. She wasn't answering her texts or her phone. This was very weird to them, as it was very unlike Sonia to do this. Sonia's mother immediately felt there was something wrong, and Claire went up to her mother's house straight away. They looked on Facebook and there was a bulletin on it saying that a body of a 31-year-old woman was found at the Plaza Hotel. Immediately Sonia's mother felt it was Sonia, and so they headed up to the hotel. When they got there, they asked if it was Sonia and the answer was yes, but they couldn't let them see her. Straight away, they felt they knew who had killed Sonia and they would be right, Eric Locke. Claire rang Sonia's friends and one of them told her she was going to meet a guy named Shane Cully. Claire went to the Gardaí with the information. The Gardaí would soon get back to them and inform them that Eric Locke handed himself in that evening to Store Street Garda Station. He was held for 24 hours and later charged with the murder of Sonia. He was remanded in custody and pleaded not guilty to the murder. On the 8th of May 2017, a jury was sworn in. 
the jury of four women and eight men were to hear opening statements on the following Thursday before Justice Moriarty. The defence would admit that Locke caused Sonia's death, but that it was not murder. The prosecution would explain that Locke did not take the ending of the relationship well and that he seemed to have threatened suicide. He said he continued to send Sonia hundreds of text messages for a considerable time, begging her for a second chance and she pleaded with him to leave her alone. She blocked him from contacting her through Facebook in February 2014. This did not go down well with Locke and so it brought him to where he set up the fake Facebook profile and started to communicate with Sonia as Shane Cully. The prosecution would show how Locke had insisted on a key card to be left at reception for him on the night he killed her, how he dumped his phone before arriving at the hotel, how he had bought a kill kit in order to subdue and kill Sonia, how he had put the do not disturb tag on the door when he left the hotel room, on the day he threatened to kill himself after Sonia pleaded with him to leave her alone. Instead, he walked off the job and rang Sonia to tell her that he was going to take his own life. The court would hear how this worried Sonia sick and resulted in her not eating or sleeping. After Sonia contacted the Gardaí and they arrested him under the Mental Health Act, he discharged himself and proceeded to write Sonia a long letter apologising for what he had done, but also told her he thought she would have stood by him. He said he would have done so if it was the other way around. Many more text messages between them were read out in court, Locke wanting to still meet Sonia, but she said he did not need to explain anything. She remained friendly and inquired about his health and treatment. Ladies, please don't do this. However, on returning to work, he sent her text messages accusing her of blanking him and inquiring about a rumour that he was stalking her. Sonia said she had heard no such rumour but asked him to stop staring at her at work. She voiced similar concerns to her friends, saying he was freaking her out. This is when she eventually blocked him on Facebook and the text messages between them also stopped. Locke then sent text messages to his own sister, stating that he and Sonia were back together, but felt that she was ripping him off. He asked if an acquaintance could hack into her Facebook account and this was refused. Then he asked for her email to be hacked also refused. This is when Locke would use the Shane Colley Facebook account in order to contact Sonia and set up the meeting at the hotel. The jury were shown CCTV footage of Locke arriving at the hotel just after midnight, getting the key card and taking the elevator to the third floor. He had put on a hat by the time he left the elevator and walked to her room. The rest of the evidence came from Locke himself as part of the investigation by the Gardaí and three psychiatrists. Yes, of course, we are going there. What would a murder charge be without a mental health defence? The accounts of what happened that night were varied when it came to Locke. With the last interview he had with Gardaí, he told them that Sonia was shocked to see him walk through the door. He said he just wanted to talk to her and this is what they had done. He said they had consensual sex. I myself called bull on this, as I'm sure you all do. When he spoke to the psychiatrist, he told them he had planned to tie her to a chair and force her to listen to an account of his pain. Oh, poor baby. He had brought restraints to scare her. He said she screamed when she saw them and that he panicked and strangled her. He said she had caused the obvious scratches on his face and she had asked what he was doing while he strangled her. He said she was making sounds, so he put her top into her mouth to silence her. The state pathologist Mary Casti would report that Sonia's t-shirt was forced so violently into her mouth that her front teeth were broken and a wire retainer had also been broken at the back of her mouth. He would beat her and strangle her with her own phone cord. It was so vicious and so prolonged that several bones were broken in her neck. She also had broader marks across her neck and chin, which would suggest she was put into a headlock. She had his DNA and her own DNA under her fingernails, and she had damaged his eye in an attempt to save her own life. She put up an unmerciful fight. Locke told psychiatrists that he redressed Sonia and put the do not disturb sign on the door and left. The jury were shown CCTV footage of him running from the scene 
five hours after his arrival at the hotel. He claimed that he made two suicide attempts afterwards, but stopped when he thought of his family. It's a pity he didn't have the same consideration for Sonia's family. He said then he decided to turn himself in instead. The defence asked for a verdict of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility due to a mental disorder. A psychiatrist testified that Locke met the criteria. The first diagnosed him with pervasive developmental disorder. Another psychiatrist had been called by the defence but was dispensed with just before he was about to give evidence. As it turned out, he was a private psychiatrist paid for by the Locke family. The jury did not receive his report. The prosecution then called a psychiatrist as a rebuttal witness. This doctor advanced the opinion that Locke may well have had a personality disorder, but not a mental disorder necessary for the defence of diminished responsibility. The prosecution argued that Locke knew well what he was doing was wrong, pointing to his insistence on having a key card, showing that he did not want to be found out by Sonia. He said there was evidence of anger and rage, wholly consistent with vengeance and retribution. The prosecution also pointed out that until the eve of the trial, Locke did not have any psychiatric diagnosis and there was no history that he ever needed mental help through his family doctor or otherwise. In fact, the first time he ever entered a mental hospital was the day he said he was going to take his own life and he discharged himself the same day. He described as distasteful that it was suggested that Sonia subconsciously wanted to see Locke again. Locke pleading not guilty because of suffering from a mental disorder and therefore diminished his responsibility did not fly with the prosecution. Justice Moriarty, on his instructions to the jury before they retired to deliberate, pointed out that while it was conceded that Locke had perpetrated the fatal act, the prosecution still had to prove the intent to kill or cause serious bodily harm, and this is what you must consider, he told them. Even if you are to reject diminished responsibility, that does not automatically mean a conviction of murder should flow from that. The other elements of murder must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. After two weeks of a trial and 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury came back with the verdict of guilty of murder. Eric Locke was sentenced to life in prison. The announcement of a guilty verdict led to shouts of yes. The Blunt family embraced each other in tears of joy and of course relief and sadness. Locke wrote a letter of an apology to be read out to the family on sentencing, but upon hearing the victim impact statements, he refrained from doing so. At sentencing, two of Sonia's sisters spoke. Claire recalled the time Sonia's son was born and how she recalled Sonia saying she couldn't believe it was possible to love someone so much. She said that Sonia had gone all out for her son's third birthday, the last day she would ever spend with him. He didn't stop smiling all day. The next day he wondered why his mammy wasn't coming to pick him up. They had to tell him that his mammy was an angel now and had to go to heaven. But this did not console Sonia's son, as when his dad had left, Sonia had promised him she would never leave him and now she had. His birthday is a hard time for him as it is for the whole family. A memory book has been made for Sonia's son, but as the years go on, his memory of her fades. He remembers things, but they are not really his memories, but more of what he is being told about his mammy. He is her legacy and he is making her proud. Claire took Sonia's son into her home as she had children his age and he slotted in perfectly with the family. So he is safe, loved and cared for. Sonia was described as adventurous, whether travelling around the world or going out dancing with her friends. Family was always important to her and she was so delighted when she was going to be a mother. She was a romantic and loved the idea of having a happy little family of her own. She was an active, happy mother and is so missed to this day. So rather than remember the Plaza Hotel murder, please remember the name Sonia Blunt. A special word of warning to everybody using social media sites. We urge you to please be cautious and be aware. It is so easy to set up false profiles. Sonia made an error of judgment and paid for this with her life. We would also like to thank the jury for the unanimous timely decision and for seeing her murderer as the lying, manipulative person that he is. For this, our family is so grateful. 
Sonia was an innocent, beautiful, kind, caring person and a mother who was sadly missed by all of us who knew her and loved her.